we're going to get right into the teaching tonight. Uh, I do really feel that the Holy Spirit is uh, kind of, how can I say, impressing very strongly upon me that people are in desperate need of this teaching about him, about his person, about his presence, uh, not only in the earth, but it's supposed to be within every believer, and his ministry in the ecclesia, the gathering together of the called out ones, the, tr the true church of Jesus Christ, as opposed to the counterfeit church that I've uh, taught you about in other lessons. Uh, I am still working on that book that uh, I hope, Lord willing, will be out this sometime this year, exposing the counterfeit church. And uh, we'll take a lot of what I taught and, and expound upon that and bring that out in that writing as well. So I thank you for being with us. We're going to get right into the teaching tonight. For those of you who have my book, uh, the, the Sinner's Prayer Gospel, Am I Really Born Again? You can follow along with me. I'm in chapter 14 of the book. And the uh, chapter is entitled, The Person of the Holy Spirit. Last time we were together... Uh, I kind of wound up with this this uh, passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 1. And I'm going to pick it up there tonight. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. And Jesus was speaking. And while being in their company and eating with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Of which he said, you have heard me speak. Okay, for John baptized with water, but not many days from now, you shall be baptized with, or placed in, or introduced into the Holy Spirit. Well, notice, two things I want you to pick up right away. The Father had promised this, and Jesus had already spoken to them about it. Where did he speak to them about it? Well, in the Gospel of John, we have it recorded in chapters 14 through 16. I've quoted it many times, where Jesus told them, It's necessary that I return to the Father, and then I will send you the promise of the Father, he said. I will send you another comforter, the Spirit of Truth. Okay, and this is going to be very crucial to our understanding, that, that title right there, the spirit of truth, because everyone today who is, how can I say, looking for anything that has to do with righteousness, okay, let's just think about our own uh, alternative media community, for instance, on the internet especially, seeking out truth, trying to mine out the truth. Well, then this title of the Holy Spirit is very significant because he is called the Spirit of Truth, which tells us, therefore, through Jesus' own words and according to the Father's uh, will and initiative, that the only way we can really lay hold on truth is if we possess the Spirit of Truth. Or another way to say it would be if we are possessed of the Spirit of Truth. Okay, so we need the spirit of truth, people. And I want you to keep that in your mind because everyone's looking for truth like it's a concept, like it's a set of um, regulations, uh, it's a group of sacraments, it's a certain religious practice, it's a certain philosophy of life, it's a certain religious doctrine. Uh, people are looking, or more than anything today, People are expecting to find truth in news shorts, whether it be videos on YouTube and in the Internet or through the alternative media or some other form of news-oriented presentation. They're looking for the truth. They want to find truth. But as I've preached about Jesus many times, uh, Jesus told us that truth is not Something, truth, is someone, even concerning himself. What did he say? He said, I am the way, the life, and the truth. Right? So Jesus proclaimed himself as truth. Remember when Pilate was standing in front of him, uh, just totally confounded by Jesus, because Jesus was making no attempt to defend himself. 
you know, to bring a defense for his actions, to justify himself, to reaffirm his title that that had been spoken of him, that he was the Messiah, that he was the king of the Jews, whatever they were calling him, the Christ, the anointed one. He made no attempt to convince this government, this high government official of the truth of his position. And Pilate, you know, uh, quips out the famous remarks that most most everybody knows, even if they're not Christians, they know this remark of Pilate when he asked Jesus, what is truth? Jesus did not respond to him with a, li with a list of things describing this concept or this philosophy or this set of rules and regulations or even the law of Moses. He didn't say anything. He just looked back at him. It's inferred in the scripture. I always get the picture in my mind. It's inferred in the scripture that Jesus just looked at him as if to say, you're looking at truth. And he said it in a different way. He said, I have come to speak the truth, and all who seek the truth, listen to me. I am the truth. Okay? Now here, Jesus was letting them know in John 14 through 16, and is reminding them here now, after his resurrection, John 14 through 16, Jesus spoke to them before his passion, before he was apprehended by the, uh, the, the soldiers from the temple and turned over to the Sanhedrin, the priests in the temple, and then eventually turned over to the Romans to be crucified. He spoke about the spirit of truth. This is now after that whole episode that whole episode of the Passion included the resurrection. This is 40 days later. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's been appearing to his disciples and confirming to them that he has risen from the dead and even proving to them that it, it, it wasn't a Gnostic thing. He wasn't a spirit. It's not just that his spirit separated from his dead body and now his spirit was around, okay, like a ghost. And that's why he, he brings that proof again in the book of John, where he presents himself to his disciples. We have the, 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 you know, the infamous episode of Doubting Thomas, where Jesus says, look, I am not a ghost. I am not a spirit. Stick your fingers in my, in my wounds. Stick your hand in my side where I was pierced by the, um, by the spear, by the Roman soldier, to, to prove that I was dead. Put your, put your hand in my side. See that I am substance. I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. He told them, give me something to eat. Give me something to drink. So they saw that he possessed a celestial body, a real body. He was not a ghost. He was not a disembodied spirit like the demons are. That's the difference. Jesus was the first resurrected human being. With a literal celestial body. For more teaching on this, go to my book, Who Are the Aliens, where I deal with the <coughs> excuse me, the different classes of beings and I talk about celestial bodies and so on. But in short, Jesus uh, uh his resurrected body was a celestial body, a resurrected, re you know, fully redeemed body. Okay, as opposed to what demons are missing today. Demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, the hybrids, uh, the offspring of fallen angels with women. And the judgment from God was that they would be stripped of their humanoid bodies. They had bodies, humanoid type bodies, not bodies created in the image of God, like we have, normal human beings. We are created in the image of God. But they had a humanoid container, so to speak, that they inhabited. But when God judged them, either through war between them, and to get more teaching on this, go to the book of Enoch, uh, where God had the holy angels set them at war one against another, and they, they slaughtered each other. And when they slaughtered each other, their spirits departed from their humanoid constructs, their bodies, okay, and they became disembodied spirits. And, and the scripture in Enoch tells us clearly that now they would torment men, they would afflict men, 
okay, but only in the spirit realm. They did know they were like mist. Nephala, another uh, translation of Nephala, is like a mist, like a cloud, like a fog. When I've cast out these uh, many times, others and myself have seen like clouds uh, spirits depart from the bodies, okay? Because they were like these foggy clouds, these spirits went into the bodies, human bodies, and possessed them. And when they're commanded to come out, when they're cast out in Jesus' name, and they're like fog, they're like a cloud, they're like a mist, nephala, okay? So, uh, they are disembodied spirits. They, You could call them ghosts, okay? They are like ghosts. Their spirits, and they masquerade as human human ghosts. So these sightings of ghosts and so on and so forth that people experience, they say, oh, "I saw an old lady, I saw a young man in a Civil War uniform, uh, I saw my dead grandmother, I saw this one, that one, the other one." Okay, these spirits can impersonate in their appearance in their uh, voice, they're the greatest imposters, the greatest impersonators, but they had no substance. They can only appear in a ghostly form because they are disembodied spirits. Jesus was therefore letting his believers, his disciples know that was not the case with him so that they would not confuse the resurrection that would come through the Lord Jesus Christ and Jehovah God the Father and the Holy Spirit, they would not confuse the resurrected bodies given to the saints at the resurrection of the just when Christ returns, either being uh, caught up from the earth directly because they have not died yet, they're still alive on the earth, or being risen literally from the ground, from the dead. Either way, they will receive new celestial bodies, resurrected bodies made of celestial substance, literal substance. It's just the difference is it's not of terrestrial substance. Okay, man was made a little lower than the angels. It tells us in the Psalms, made a little lower than the angels, but later we shall be exalted above the angels. Okay, John says we know not what we shall be, but this much we know. As he is, we shall be like him. So we will receive the same Christ received upon his resurrection. Paul lays that out for us in 1 Corinthians 15, especially. If those of you that want to study that out, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul teaches about the resurrected body. Okay, And that's also what it's referring to in 1 Thessalonians 4. Okay, these are the scriptures that are used to describe what people commonly are referring today to as the rapture, uh, not having to do with the timing now. We're not talking about that right now, but the there is an event where uh, the saints will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, whether they come out of the ground because they're dead already or they come directly off the earth because they're still alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Either way. They're going to receive the same type of resurrected body, the celestial uh, construct that Jesus had. So Jesus showed them this. I am not a ghost. I am not a disembodied spirit like the evil spirits that you saw me casting out of people. That I commanded to go into the swine. I am not the same type of spirit. I am of a higher order. I am, first of all, holy. And secondly, I am literal substance. I'm not a foggy, cloudy, dark, evil mist like the demons are. Okay? All right. So, um, Jesus was the truth. Jesus is the truth, not was. Forgive me. Jesus is the truth. But he's telling his disciples here in, that uh, in John 14 through 16, it's necessary that I go back to the Father, because if I go back to the Father, then I can send you the spirit of truth, the spirit of wisdom. Wisdom goes right along with truth, doesn't it? The spirit of revelation and knowledge, right? 
Paul prays in Ephesians, I pray that, that God the Father would fill you with the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. So, those of you, first of all, here's the first, here's the first, uh, what's the word, on it? hurdle we need to get over. Are we looking for the knowledge of Christ? Because many are not looking for the knowledge of Christ when they talk about seeking truth. They just want to find out what's really going on in the news. Well, that's nothing distinctly Christian, people. You know, there are many sinners out here, atheists, agnostics, Satanists even, occultists, who want to know what's really going on behind the scenes. There's nothing instinctively or distinctly Christian about the desire to know what's really going on in the world. Okay? So if do you think that's what sets you apart as a Christian, is that you want to know what's really going on behind the double speak, and that's what sets you apart from, from being an unbeliever and making you a believer in God is because you want to know the truth behind the news. That's not the, dis the distinguishing uh, feature of the Christian, okay? The distinguishing feature of the Christian is that Christian wants to learn Christ. He wants to learn of Christ. He wants to be one with Christ. Okay, so that's the first question. When you say you're seeking truth, do you mean that you're seeking Christ, the one who is truth? Or are you seeking worldly truth and the same with wisdom and revelation and understanding and and knowledge and so on okay because the world is seeking these things too they're looking for knowledge they're looking for understanding they're looking for even revelation people you got a lot of people out here in the mystery religions and you know the different philosophies new age and and everything else they're they're trying to get revelation they want to they want to be spiritual. They want spiritual uh, mysteries to be unveiled to them, many. But that doesn't mean that they're seeking the spirit of truth. You understand the difference? So Jesus, of course, he is the truth. But he is also one with the Holy Spirit and one with the Father. So therefore, the Father is naturally the Father of truth. He's the the Father, the origin of all truth, right? All truth has its ultimate genesis in the Father. And secondly, the Holy Spirit, because he is also God and one with the eternal Son of Man and the Father. Okay, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, and I've, I've spoken this many times, and I hope people will get it. Those of you that want to get into, you know, Jewish-type bondage, uh, listen to what the Lord said. The Lord did not say, the Lord our God, the Lord is one person. It was given to Moses to teach the people, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, the Godhead is one. They are one. One God demonstrated in three personalities, but one God. But And they are one with one another. Okay, so therefore, that's what that declaration means. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. It doesn't mean the Lord is one person. Okay? So for all you anti-Trinitarians out there who are using that as your basis to discount even the existence of the Holy Spirit or to totally discredit the eternal Son of Man from being able to be the Son of the living God, uh, you're wrong. Okay? Because you misunderstand what the scriptures really mean. Just like Jesus told the Pharisees and the rabbis and so of his day, he said, you are in error, not rightly understanding the scriptures. How do we rightly understand the scriptures? We need the spirit of truth. And that's what I'm asking you tonight. Do you have the spirit of truth? Does he live inside you? The spirit of truth is a person. So truth, again, is a person. Jesus is the truth. The Holy Spirit is the truth. The Holy Spirit doesn't just have the truth. 
He doesn't possess the truth. He, he doesn't, excuse me, dispense or give out the truth. I want you to get this, and this is not semantics, people. It makes a big, big difference in our understanding and our receiving the revelation thereof and, and getting into the practice of it, of understanding that we are intimately connected with, intimately connected to truth as a person. Okay, truth is not an attribute of this person. The truth is not a possession of this person. It's not even a gift of the Holy Spirit. There's not a gift of the Holy Spirit called truth. The Holy Spirit doesn't give us a gift of truth. He is the Spirit of truth. And when He comes to take residence in us through the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as we're going to get into, then we possess the person of truth within our very beings. So we're no longer looking for truth and seeking truth outside of ourselves. You see the difference? So let me throw this out to you, because I'm going to tell you, even though they're deceived on one side, many of the other religions and, and the other philosophies Okay, like Hinduism and Buddhism and spiritualism and New Age and so on and so forth. Uh, they they'll say God is within me, or I have the 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 truth within me. Well, they're actually closer to the truth than many people who claim to be Christians today, because those who are claiming to be Christians, the majority of them, especially in the West, Western world, are seeking truth. As an inanimate object or philosophy or whatever, re religious uh, set of rules, true, whatever it is, seeking it outside of themselves as an it. Just like I've taught you about the church not being an it. Yeah? When I, when I throw out to you the question, what is the church? And it can't be answered. It can't be answered because the church is not a what. The church is a whom. So the, the, that question can only be answered if the right question is asked. Who is the church? Now I can answer. Who is the church? The body of Christ. The bride of Christ. The ecclesia. The gathering together of the called out ones. Okay, well it's the same thing here when it comes to truth. The truth, the truth is not an it. So if I say, what is the truth? Like Pilate asked Jesus, the same error he asked him, what is the truth? Jesus didn't answer him. Because that question is already an error. Now, if Pilate would have said, who is the truth? Then Jesus would have said, you're looking at the truth. You understand? So it's the same common denominator running through all these things, people. Yeah? Truth is a person. Who is the truth? Who is the spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit. Right? Not what is the truth. Not what is the truth behind the, the, the false presentation of the news through the media or false education or false religion. What is the truth behind all that double speak and deception? No, no. You're not going to find the truth that way. And so many Christians are feverishly and passionately pounding, you know, at, at, at finding that answer. But it's the wrong question because they're looking for truth as if it's an it. But the truth is a person. Okay, so yes, the New Agers and all these other false religion people, they're wrong when they say the truth is within or God is within only because they have the wrong God. But the concept of the truth is within, or God is within, is correct. It's just that Satan has come in and masqueraded as that spirit. Masqueraded as that truth. And gives them a counterfeit spirit. A demon spirit. Right? 
they adhere to a demon spirit or they are possessed of a demon spirit or they may have the visitation from a fallen angel. That's how these false religions have started, many of them. For instance, Islam and Mormonism both attribute the revelation to the visitation of an angel. If these two are not liars, okay, if Muhammad was not lying or whoever really wrote the Quran was not lying, and this Joseph Smith was not lying, then the only the conclusion that can be uh, that one can come to is that they had a visitation, literally by one of three type of creatures. Either they saw a fallen angel, demon spirit masquerading as an angel, or a hybrid creature, a nephilim, a mixture appearing in a humanoid form and claiming to be an angel. But either way. Uh, it's the wrong spirit, and they were given a wrong doctrine, a wrong truth. If that, you know, that's really an oxymoron, right? A wrong truth. A truth can't be wrong, because if truth is wrong, then it's error. So they were given a spirit of error. They were given an erroneous doctrine, an erroneous teaching, by a fallen spirit. Okay? Not the spirit of truth. But, they understood the, these these other religions have a better grasp many times than what we're calling Christianity today, which I'm telling you is the false church, okay, the counterfeit church. What they're teaching in the counterfeit church, they talk about the Holy Spirit, they talk about Jesus Christ, you know, a lot of them, not all anymore, but a, a great deal of them, Bible believing even, okay, and the Father, but. They're still looking for truth outside of themselves. They're looking for spiritual power outside of themselves, right? They want the spirit to come. They want the spirit to invade the temple, which means a church building or a cathedral. They have not the revela received the revelation that they are the temple. They have not understood that. It's the same with truth because he's the spirit of truth. So, all the people that are out there, you know, the news behind the news, prophecy behind the news, this and you know, I'm not I'm not picking on any particular ministry or individual. There's a whole big movement out there of people with many streams trying to unravel the truth, but they're seeking that truth by um this how can I say dissembling, dismantling trying to interpret and decode news items and and signs and everything else. But the origin or the genesis, the foundation of truth, is not in some facts that can be mined out behind the surface of deceptions. Okay? The foundation of truth is a person, and he is the spirit of truth, and he is the Holy Spirit whom Christ has sent. I'm going to repeat this again. While Jesus was in their company eating with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, forgive me, but to wait for what the Father had promised, of which he said, you have heard me speak. And I mentioned where that came from in the book of John. For John baptized with water, but not many days from now, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what I was just talking about, because notice the fleshly mindset of his initial apostles and disciples, just like we have the fleshly mindset today in those who I believe are genuinely, many of them are genuinely seeking after Christ. They want to know the truth. They want to follow Christ. They want to be good with God. They don't want to follow Satan. Okay, but they've been taught wrongly. They've been taught error. They've been taught erroneous doctrine concerning where truth comes from, who truth is, and what their focus is supposed to be. 
Listen to how Jesus focuses them when they bring forth their question. And see if you don't recognize the same questions being asked today by those who are seeking the truth or seeking after God. Notice what they ask him. He just talked to them about the Holy Spirit. But notice how they respond. So when they were assembled, they asked him, Lord, is this the time? Is that not the biggest question <coughs> Excuse me. that's all over the Internet, that's all through the prophetic streams and the end times prophecy type streams of the body of Christ, of the church today? Is this the time when you will reestablish the kingdom and restore it, Israel. So there you had a, a strong Zionist uh, spirit there already back in that time. It, you know, Israel, Israel. Is this the time, Lord? Is this that time that you spoke about where you said the fig tree would blossom? When you see the figs blossoming on the fig tree and you see all these signs, know that this is the beginning of sorrows. And this is the time of, of uh, when you will soon come and reckon all accounts. And when you will reestablish Israel. What's the biggest focus today in the prophetic circles? The biggest focus in prophetic circles today is either the Antichrist in the tribulation period and the rapture or the state of Israel. Those are the big subjects. And most of the answers, if not all, about those issues are erroneous, are wrong, because the focus is wrong. And they're not receiving the answer from the spirit of truth. They're trying to deduce it and decode it and figure it out in the powers of their own intellect. By trying to mine out the intel and discern the prophecies with their minds and so on and so forth and research it out. So they have the same question as these initial disciples did. Their focus was on this world. Their focus, excuse me, was on the events of the time. Okay, on, on the current events of their time. They were concerned with the current events of their time. And they could only connect, listen to me now, they could only connect God, God's kingdom, the Messiah, whom Christ was, and they understood at this point by now, they could only connect God and his kingdom with the aspect or the focus on current events. Why? Because they were still in their worldly, fleshly mind. They had not yet received truth. See, truth was still outside them. Well, who is truth? Well, in that sense, at this time still, here in Acts chapter 1, Jesus was still the truth for them, right? But Jesus was outside of them. Just like he told them in John 14 through 16. I have been with you, but I will send the, the comforter or the spirit of truth. He shall be in you. So truth was still outside of the disciples at this point. And that's where Jesus was trying to get them to focus in his statement, which was, Go back, stay in Jerusalem, wait for the promise of the Father. And we'll get into that more, what that goes, uh, what he has to say about that, okay? But notice where they're coming from. They want to know what time it is. What time is it, Lord? Are we the last generation? Listen, they had no concept. They would have never imagined in the farthest regions of their imagination, they could have never visualized another 2,000 years of human history. They would have never thought. They were convinced that this was the end of time. They thought, especially now, they were, they were believing it when Jesus was not even in his glorified state yet, right? When he came into the temple... When he came into, on Passover, came into the temple riding on, on the donkey, and they were hailing him as the Messiah, they already saw the restoration of Israel and the kingdom of God being realized 
at that point when Jesus was still in the incarnate state, in his fleshly state, not in his resurrected state. How much more so now that Jesus is standing in front of them in a supernatural, resurrected, eternal state, would they expect that now the kingdom of Israel would be established? Now God would judge the heathen powers and establish Israel as the center of his government and his kingdom. And Jesus would reign there as Messiah, right? They would have never, never in, their, in the widest stretch of imagination had believed that there would be at least another 2,000 years of human history after their death, after they fell asleep, there would be another 2,000 years of what we call the church. But notice how Jesus responds to them. And I want you people today that are on this track of these questions or this question. Is this the time when you will establish the kingdom, Lord? Will you restore Israel at this time? Those of you that are on this track, and most of you listening to me, are either on this track or have been on this track and have realized that it's really not bringing peace to your heart. It's not bringing joy. It's not causing you to grow in the Lord. Well, notice how Jesus responds to them and refocuses them. He said to them, verse 7, it is not for you to become acquainted with and know what time brings the things and events of time and their definite periods or fixed years and seasons, their critical niche in time, which the Father has appointed, fixed and reserved by his own choice and authority and personal power. In other words, Jesus said, listen, you're barking up the wrong tree, guys. This is not your business. This is not your business, because even if I tell you those things, even if I give you the specific answer to those uh, intellectual queries, it's not going to empower you to live the kingdom of God on the earth, to be in union with me, to become one with me, and to walk with me for the rest of your lives in oneness, in union with me. You're not going to be empowered against the infernal forces of darkness that will operate in the times and seasons that you're questioning me about. Do you see that, people? Everyone today wants to know who the Antichrist is. Okay? Are we entering their understanding of the seven-year tribulation period? Uh, this, you know, how is how is the Satan going to work through this government? How is Satan going to work through this military? You know, what Satan's doing through science, this and that and the other, all the different stuff. When exactly is the Lord coming? What kind of giant is this? What kind of demon is this? What kind of fallen angel is that? You know, or... Most of it's not even that spiritual. Most of it's always on a local level, an economic level. What's going to happen with the economy? Uh, is the United States going to be taken over? You know, are we going to get bombed by Russia? Is Islam going to take over the, the world, take over the West? All these things. But even if God were to give someone the answer to those questions, if they are not empowered with the next piece of scripture we're going to look at here, it doesn't do them any good because they don't have any power over those things. So that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying you have the wrong focus. It is not for you. I want you Christians to hear me tonight. It is not for for you to know about these specific things and events in time and definite period and, and their critical mission time and so on and so forth. The things that the Father has appointed 
by his own sovereignty and authority and personal power. It, this is not for you to be focused upon. The Father's got that. That is in the Father's hands. And you may not live to see those things. Look, this generation here that Jesus was speaking to, they would not live to see those things. Let's even say that tonight, that we are that final generation that they were asking about. Okay, the generation that's going to see Jesus return, that's going to see the nations judged, that's going to see Christ reign from Jerusalem, and so on and so forth, all right? Let's say that we are that generation. We are really living in that. Well, look at the, the people that were, were here asking him this 2,000 years ago. This was totally irrelevant to them. But they didn't see it that way. They didn't see it that way. They were convinced this is what's most important. This is what's about to happen. And this is what we need to know. And this Gnostic knowledge of future events is going to empower us. I want you to make the connection, people. Because that's what we have the majority of the Christian church, what we would call the Christian church today, who's awake, who's not off in fantasy land chasing money and wanting to be gay and, and all this other stuff, okay? The people who are really wanting to know truth, not total, you know, not, not those that are given over to a, repro, a reprobate mind completely and have no desire for truth, want to throw the Bible in the trash can and, and just be... Uh, you know, perverts and crazy people and justify that. Okay, not those people. Not that part of the false counterfeit church. But the other part, which is a much smaller part, that are looking for what is the truth, this is where they're at. Trying to figure out the times and the seasons and, you know, this blood moon and that, you know, fallen star and this... Uh, supposed antichrist figure. Is it the guy from Turkey? Is it Obama? Is it the Pope? It's on and on. And I'm not saying these things are not important and we can't study them out. You'll hear me preach and teach on them. But I want you to see as far as Christ is concerned, what he sees as important, and I don't believe he's changed his position. I don't believe he's changed his position from 2,000 years ago here Till now, with the disciples of today, I believe he would say the same things to his potential disciples of today as he said to his potential disciples 2,000 years ago here. So he tells them that's not what you need to be focused upon. Well, then what are we to be focused upon? Because to us, that's what's relevant, Lord Jesus. I mean... That's what's going on. That's what's relevant. That's the world that we live in. Notice what Jesus says, verse 8. But you shall receive power. Say it with me. But you shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends or the very bounds of the earth. And when he had said this, this is the last thing he had to say. I want you to think about it. It doesn't, the dialogue doesn't go on longer. This is his final statement. This is his final pronouncement before he's lifted off the earth and goes into the heavens for the next 2,000 years. This is his final statement. Don't be focused so much on speculation about whether this is the time and what season and the kingdom of Israel and, and all this other stuff, not this, but this is what I want you to focus on. As I told you, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Verse 8 continues with the, with the reason why. You shall receive power, ability, 
efficiency and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's the issue. That's what Jesus was concerned about. He's telling him, you can know all that stuff. You can be a genius. I mean, these guys that write these books, I mean, I'm very impressed with their knowledge. Some of the, the Christians today that are writing on these subjects and stuff, very informative. I mean, excellent journalists, excellent researchers. I mean, they really have a blessed intellect. But that intellect, that knowledge doesn't give them the power over the evil forces. They think it does. And that's why I call them Gnostics. Because the Gnostics of old, from this time period that we're talking about here, 2,000 years ago, okay, in the time of the first Christians, especially the first Gentile Christians, the Gnostics believed that Christ was a key to unlock the secret knowledge that they needed to live this spiritual life and to overcome the evils of the world, which they understood to be the physical, material world. They saw the physical body, they saw the physical world, the cosmos, as corrupt as evil, and they saw the soul, their understanding, and this was transferred over from Stoicism, this was transferred over from Platonism and from what Socrates taught, Plato taught, on and on, that the soul was pure. That's what they understood. The soul was connected to God or connected to this greater giver, the mover who cannot be moved. This was all from Greek philosophy. And it entered into Christianity and became Gnosticism. And we have Gnostics today, folks. We have Gnostics today in the American church that believe that this knowledge, the knowledge of the time when the kingdom will be established, when Israel will be restored, okay, the definite periods and the, you know, the seasons and the events, the particular events of time that the Father holds in his hand, that if they can figure these things out and if they can teach the Christians these things, which there's no end to, it's a Pandora's box, it's a bottomless pit, there's always a new, a new thing to figure out. But if they can teach the Christians, they can learn these things, teach the Christians these things, that this is going to give them the power, this gnosis, this knowledge is going to give them power in the evil day. But they are mistaken. And Jesus tells them here, you are mistaken if you think knowing these things is what's going to empower you against Satan and the fallen angels and the disembodied spirits, the demons, and the hybrids, and so on and so forth, and even the evil governments and, and given over human beings who hold the sword in their hand and hold government legislation in their hand, who run the prisons and the death camps, if you think this is what's going to give you power over those spirit forces, you are mistaken. But I tell you where your focus should be. You shall receive power, dunamis in the Greek, supernatural, spiritual, God-breathed power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So Jesus focused, I submit to you tonight as we go into the break of the hour here in a minute or so, and I want you to meditate on this. Jesus focused from the beginning of the establishment of the ecclesia, the church, is the person and the power and the ministry and the rulership in the church of the Holy Spirit. Not gnosis. Not 
unraveling the mysteries of what's going on in Israel and what's going on in Turkey and what's going on in the Vatican and what's going on in the White House and what's going on with the royals, those Nephilim over there. All these things, yeah, they may be true and we know about this. But knowledge about this doesn't give us power over it. I'll say it again. Knowledge about this does not give us power over it. But you shall receive power, supernatural power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you guys are running around witnessing, right? We have whole groups of precious people who really... I believe in their hearts, many of them, they really want to serve God. They think they're serving God in the highest way. Witnessing and witnessing and witnessing, evangelizing. Even these, these evangelists of end time prophecy and, and the news behind the news, their heart is to truly serve God and they want to tell the people. They want to warn the people. So they're witnessing. Fantastic. But the Lord Jesus says, first, before you witness, you need the power so that your witness is not of the flesh. It's not of flesh and blood. It's not merely from the mind of man, from the soul of man, from the intellect of man, but it's coming from the breath. Of God himself in all signs and wonders and mighty deeds through the Holy Spirit. So when he had said this, even as they were looking at him, he was caught up and a cloud received and carried him away out of their sight. Acts chapter 1 verses 4 through 9 I've read to you from the Amplified. We're going to go ahead and take our break at this hour. And we'll be back in a few minutes, and we'll get into some more exciting stuff. Okay, I, I brought out to you that, you know, the landmark uh, scriptures that Jesus spoke about receiving the, the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus even referred back to what John the Baptist had prophesied. Luke, you know, Luke uh, recounts that here in his writing. That John the Baptist had told the leaders of the temple, those who supposedly understood the scriptures. He said, no, I'm not the Messiah. I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare for the Messiah. I baptize you with water unto repentance. In other words, my baptism is to prepare you to receive the kingdom of God. But my baptism is not the receiving of the kingdom of God. And many of you tonight that are listening to me, you've received the baptism of John. You've truly repented of your sins and you meant it. And you've even followed the Lord in water baptism, which I've taught you about. You've been baptized in the water, in water for the washing away of your sins. But, You've not received the kingdom of God. Because John the Baptist goes on to say, But there is one coming after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will, here's the word again, baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This is another baptism. And this is the one Jesus is speaking about here in Acts chapter 1, when he recounts what John said. And he said, now, yes, you have prepared yourselves through the waters of repentance. You've been baptized through John's baptism. You've repented of your sins. Okay, even those of you that have done that genuinely by, you know, saying the sinner's prayer, so to speak, and being baptized in water and, and, and going to church and learning the scriptures to the best of your ability and sitting under preaching and teaching. You prepared yourself initially 
through the waters of repentance to receive the kingdom. But have you received the kingdom? What is the kingdom? Well, you're going to have a misunderstanding of the kingdom. If you're focused, like we, foc like we showed here, the disciples' initial focus in the flesh, that they were seeing the kingdom as something, again, outside of them, having to do with the political um, tremors and the economic conditions and the religious condition and the affairs of, of the world surrounding Israel, they saw as the kingdom. The Messiah's literal physical reign from Jerusalem over the heathen nations. But yet Jesus said, what about the kingdom of God? He said, the kingdom of God is within you. What else did he say? He said, do not think that the kingdom of God is represented in food and drink and such natural outward things. He said, but the kingdom of God is represented in love, joy, and peace. In the Holy Spirit. He said that before the Holy Spirit was even available to the people. He prophesied that the kingdom of God is manifest and experienced through the person of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, how do we receive the kingdom of God? Many of you have been taught one way or another that you receive the kingdom of God by repentance and being baptized in water. The best of you have been taught that, okay? Most of you have been taught in the last 30 to 40 years by saying some Gnostic prayer that some pastor or evangelist, uh, you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek spoke. He only did it because he had to and trying not to embarrass everyone. Okay, but even the best case scenario that you did as Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, you believed in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and you believe that you received him into your heart, even though that has no biblical or scriptural backing, receiving Jesus into your heart. Okay, metaphorically we can speak that way, but logistically and, and, and literally, that's not a, that's not a bib scriptural concept. We don't receive Jesus into our heart. We receive the Holy Spirit into our spirits. Let me say that again. We don't receive Jesus into our hearts. We receive the Holy Spirit into our spirits. So many of you, you meant it. You were genuine. You were sincere. And you asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins. And you asked the Lord. You told him you want to be born again. And many of you even went to the next level. And you were baptized in water for the remission of your sins, for the washing away of your sins. You prepared yourself to receive the kingdom. And then you went and sat down and waited for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years for Jesus to come back. Because that was your understanding of the kingdom. Your understanding of the kingdom of heaven, of course, Right there, when I say the kingdom of heaven, what comes to mind? Clouds, harps, golden streets, whatever. All those kind of pictures. All the imagery of what we understand heaven to be. If I say the kingdom of God, many of us more would think of Jesus returning and ruling from Israel, ruling from Jerusalem, and establishing the kingdom of God. Just like these initial Hebrew disciples understood it. Yet Jesus and John the Baptist, even before him, prophesied that the kingdom of God is in the spirits. And we have to receive the kingdom of God. Right? That's why Jesus said, you shall receive power. He could have just as well said, you shall receive the kingdom of God when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. All right? So that's what I want to focus on tonight. I want you to keep that in your heart and mind as I'm speaking. Stop seeing the kingdom of God outside of yourself. Stop seeing the Holy Spirit outside of yourself. 
Stop seeing the truth outside of yourself. Stop seeing wisdom, knowledge, love, compassion, the gifts of the Spirit, the power. Stop seeing it outside of yourself. See this person of the Holy Spirit within yourself. Because this is scriptural. This is what Jesus promised. This is what the Father promised. This is what Jesus sent. And this is what the Holy Spirit has accomplished. And for those of us who have truly come into the kingdom of God, or had the kingdom of God come into us, this is what we have received. Okay, you can follow along with me in chapter 14 of Sinner's Prayer Gospel person of the Holy Spirit. I say here, every believer, yes, I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be a sissy. I'm sorry. I'm not going to back up because I don't want to offend people and not include people because we know that the gospel today must be all inclusive, just like a cheap vacation to Greece. It must be all inclusive. We have to include everyone, even if we know they didn't qualify, even if they didn't go to the travel agent and they didn't pay for their ticket and, and they didn't uh, get what is needed to be in the all-inclusive vacation, we should just let them come and bankrupt the hotel because we want to be fair to everybody, okay? So that's the same attitude when it comes to this here. As much as I would love to say everybody has the Holy Spirit, everybody has received the kingdom of God just because they mouth the name Jesus, or they can mouth scriptures, or they go to church, or they serve in ministry, or whatever. Unfortunately, I cannot say that. I have to say what Jesus said, and that is that every believer is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yes. What am I talking about? That second baptism, right? We just looked at it. The baptism of John, the baptism of repentance in water, is to prepare one to receive the kingdom. But then there's a second baptism. And who performs that baptism? Very crucial. John said, I performed the first baptism. Okay? And he represents if you want to call it, the clergy, the ministry, the five-fold ministry, okay, whatever colloquialism you want to use for convenience right now, those who are ministering for the Lord, we can be seen in John. We are baptizing people in water unto repentance. That's fine. We baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or we baptize them in the name of Jesus. But, we do not baptize people in the Holy Spirit. Who does that? Well, Jesus said very clearly. And John said of Jesus very clearly. What did John say? John said, I baptize you in water unto repentance, but he who's coming after me. Well, we know from the stories of the Gospels, and Matthew and Luke in particular, who the he was that came after John. And John said to him, I'm, I'm the one who should be baptized by you, not me baptizing you. And the Christ, the Messiah, the eternal Son of Man, Jesus of Nazareth, replied and said, John, we got to follow the program of my Father. Let us fulfill all righteousness. Let me lay out the pattern for my body. Let me be the example. I'm the head. So the head must do what the rest of the body is going to be commanded to do. So first, I will submit to you, even though I'm sinless, regardless, I will submit to you for the baptism of water, for the washing away of the sin I don't have. But those that I will call, they will need to have their sins washed away through my blood that I will shed on the tree for their forgiveness. What happened when Jesus got up? John saw the Holy Spirit descending upon him as if in the form of the dove. What happened then? No, we're not told, unfortunately, that Jesus spoke in tongues. It doesn't say it. But it's to be assumed, people, because everything else 
that Jesus modeled for us, we have followed suit. We have a stronger evidence of his possession by the Holy Spirit, because the scripture said he was so full of the Spirit that he was driven by the Spirit out into the desert to take the devil on. He had to be full of the Spirit to be driven out to take the devil on. So Jesus himself, I know this is radical teaching for you people. You've been listening to that sissy ice cream stuff so long. But listen to me, this is scripture. Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon Christ, came into Christ, and possessed him. That's why Paul, or the writer of Colossians, echoing Paul, wrote years later, and the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Christ bodily. Now, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ and the church bodily. We are now his body. But when Christ was on the earth, the church had not yet been birthed. So he was the head and the body of Christ. And he was possessed by the Holy Spirit. And when he was confronted by religious leaders who were controlled and perhaps filled with demon spirits, because he called them the children of the devil, who were blaspheming the Holy Spirit, Jesus always said, I do these works by the Holy Spirit. And because you're blaspheming what I'm doing and calling the spirit by whom I do these works a demon or a devil, you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. He, didn't say, he said, you can blaspheme the Father. You can blaspheme me, and it will be forgiven you if you repent. But if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, through whom I am performing these mighty signs and wonders, you will not be forgiven in this life or in the life to come. Do you see that, people? Do you see that? Jesus was full of... Of the Holy Spirit. And he commands the same of us. The command that we read in Acts chapter 1. At the beginning of the program. And we talked about so much. Jesus gave this command to the initial 120 emphatically. Okay, that 120. We're told about 120 in the upper room, right? The people that were given this command to wait in Jerusalem. To receive the promise of the Father, whom Jesus would send. For Jesus would baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Jesus told this initial 120 emphatically as a command that before they did or said anything, or embarked upon any type of kingdom mission or ministry, that they were to return Without question, unequivocally, they were to return to Jerusalem and wait to receive the promise of the Father. He declared that he would send this gift of power upon them, and they would be supernaturally empowered to carry out his work. He absolutely, I want you people to hear me, all you non-sanctioned Witnesses and evangelists and preachers and teachers of the word out there. He absolutely, Christ, absolutely granted no sanction whatsoever for the ministry to be carried out without the reception of this baptism of fire first. We have the facts in scripture. What did Jesus say to them when they were talking about all these things they were ready to go run out and preach about, right? That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to be able to go back and tell the people when Israel would be established, when the kingdom would be, would be born, when the heathen powers would be overthrown, so on and so forth. But Jesus told them, no, you don't go anywhere and you don't say anything and you don't do anything till you receive power from on high, meaning the Holy Spirit. Then you will be what? Filled with all power. Then you shall be my witnesses, he said. 
but he absolutely granted no sanction for ministry to be carried out without the reception of this baptism of fire first. The promise is the Father's, and Christ is the one who sends it. Jesus Christ, I want you Jesus Christ worshipers out there to hear me. All of you out there who say, I worship Jesus Christ, but that baptism in the Holy Spirit and that tongues talking stuff and all that, I, re I don't receive that. Well, then you're rejecting Jesus because Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. What did John say? John didn't say, and there's one coming after the one who comes after me, the Holy Spirit, and he will baptize you in himself. That's not what the scripture reads. The scripture reads in several places that Jesus, the Father, sends the promise, but Jesus actually does the baptizing in the Holy Spirit. Don't ask me the mechanics of that. It's supernatural. I can't explain to you the mechanics. All I know is what the Word says. Jesus told them, you go back to Jerusalem and you wait. I am sending you the Holy Spirit. Okay, and we already quoted the scripture where John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who comes after me, whose sandals I'm not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. We have that in two Gospels. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Mark chapter 1, verse 8. So Jesus Christ is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. So listen to me good now. Listen to me good, because I doubt that you will hear anyone else say this. And as I told you, I think it was last week, I don't mind being the odd man out. I don't mind being what they love to call the Lone Ranger, okay, who's not submitted to their false Pharisee, Sadducee, uh, Sanhedrin authority, not under their false covering of doctrines of demons and seducing spirits in the counterfeit church. I'll stand alone. The Holy Ghost and I are a majority. I'll stand alone with the Holy Spirit in saying this, and listen to me well. Therefore, a rejection of this dogmatically issued command from the Master is not disobedience to the Holy Spirit, but rather disobedience to Christ. So those of you out there who say, well, I follow Jesus, I obey Jesus, and I'm only doing what Jesus and the Word says. Well, Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if you reject the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you de reject the command from Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Master, the Savior of your soul, according to your confession. Your Lord. He's the one who tells you, you have to be filled with power from on high. You have to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You cannot divide. Now, now if we start acting this way, then the, the Jews and the other religions who, who call us polytheists, the worshipers of many gods, they have an argument. If we split up Jesus and the Holy Spirit and say, well, I only listen to Jesus, but I'm not interested in the Holy Spirit, well, then we, we have become, we have become spiritual polygamists. We have become polytheists. We have become worshipers of many gods, like we're accused of by the, the Jewish people and the, and the Muslims and other religions. Because we are making this division and turning this into a paganism. Where we are turning them into separate gods with separate wills, with separate agendas, and agendas that, and agendas that are even contrary to one another. But according to scripture, and according to the master's words himself, we know this not to be the case. I'm going to say it again. Therefore, a rejection of this dogmatically issued command from the Master Jesus 
is not disobedience to the Holy Spirit, but rather disobedience to Christ. I find it confounding that so many who claim to be born-again Christians and still insist on denying the veracity and necessity of obedience to this mandate, how such bold spoken allegiance to Christ, allegiance to Christ as their Savior and Lord. Because it's He who is, that they are directly and defiantly disobeying. I want you to get this tonight. It's Jesus' baptism you are rejecting. You are rejecting Christ's command. You are disobeying Christ's command, and you are rejecting Christ's baptism, Christ's gift, not the Holy Spirit's. Most of these people would never have the audacity to flout his command to be baptized in water as confirmation of their acceptance of his salvation, yet they find the boldness from somewhere I'll tell you where from, from demons that are teaching out of the mouths of apostate pastors and teachers and evangelists in the counterfeit church, okay, and writing their sissy, heresy books out there that have not only nothing to do with the Holy Spirit anymore, not even anything to do with Jesus anymore, it's all about them, okay? That's where they're getting this boldness from, it's a worldly boldness, it's an arrogance. It's what the scripture talks about when it says, In the last days shall come scoffers and mockers who will say, Where's the sign of his coming? The, the world has gone on every day like it has from the beginning. Nothing has changed. Isn't that the attitude of our world today? We just need to learn how to, you know, prosper for ourselves today, succeed for ourselves today. We just need to enjoy our best life now. Let me tell you something. That best life now philosophy is the same as saying what the scripture says about the people, what they said before the flood came. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. All we have is this life. This life is all that matters. Let's learn how to master this life. Let's not be concerned about the next life and about the Holy Spirit and all this you know, deep spiritual Hubba bulub. We need to make money. We need to succeed. We need to have nice houses, nice cars. We need to keep up with the Joneses, like they used to say. This is this is the attitude of most postmodern Christianity, especially in the West today. But this is from demons, people. This is not from the Holy Spirit. This is not from Jesus Christ. And this is not from Jehovah. Elohim, this is not from the Father. This is from Satan. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Okay? So they get this boldness, whether they realize it or not, directly or indirectly, from demon spirits, from demons, from seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. So the Lord says to such people, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say. 646, I'm quoting from the NIV. Luke 646. Why do you call me Lord? Lord, he puts a double emphasis on it. In other words, you're such a hypocrite. You're, he gives a double emphasis. So this, this is to get... You know, he's trying to jab at the really religious people, people who put on a real religious show. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? What don't they do that he says? They don't obey his first command. That's his first command. What was his first command? I just showed you. From Acts chapter 1, that's the first command he gave the soon-to-be birth church. Upon his ascension, that was his la those were his last words before he would leave them physically. And his first command, which he, you know, qualifiedly and emphatically made clear, this is the first order of business. Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not go anywhere. Do not say anything. 
do not do anything until the person of the Holy Spirit comes into you. Okay? Therefore, the original 120, I want you to hear this. They were the seed of the church. And they were not permitted by Christ to step out uh, without this experience. They were not permitted by Christ to step out and represent him and go preach the gospel of the kingdom in his name until they had received this experience. Okay? And I just want to stress something else here. They were the seed of the church. At that time, they represented the whole church. Okay? So they were not the Pentecostal or the charismatic or the fanatic, or the the intellectually ignorant, or the emotionally overboard section of the church. Okay? They weren't the minority section of the church, the blacks and the Hispanics and the people in foreign lands who don't have enough intellect, so they need all this emotional hubbub of love. But we Anglo-Saxon white people will go ahead and get along with our intellect. I know I'm hitting you hard. But the statistics back that up, people. Go look up Barnes' statistics. He just did a recent study on that. That particularly the white people reject the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they think they're so damn smart. That's why. They went to the best universities, supposedly. They're book learned. They make a lot of money. Another thing that was said in that in that report, which I thought was really good, people who make $100,000 or more all of a sudden lose their interest and need for God. But as you start to descend in economic security, all of a sudden you abound in faith. So the people from 50000 to 100000 believed more in God than the people who made over 100000 And the people under 50000 they're the ones that are desperate for God. They're the, all those tongue-talking, crazy, roll-on-the people, desperate, you know, desperate people uh, for God. Well, we see that in the scripture. Jesus said what? He didn't say it's impossible, but he said it's definitely harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God than it is for someone with great existential need. Because the flesh is very deceptive, and the Satan who manipulates the flesh is very deceptive. And when the flesh is comfortable, it forgets God. And so when I'm making a lot of money, and I live in a nice house, and I can have anything I pretty much want, and I'm not sick, you know, I don't feel very needy. That's why God warned the Israelites, speaking of prosperity. The Lord said, I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to bless you when I bring you into the land. But what was his first admonition? Again, as always, but when you enter the land and the Lord has blessed you, prospered you, go now and forget the Lord your God. See how it works? Okay, so I just want to stress that. That this was the seed of the church. These were the seedlings. This this was the church. There was no Gentile church. Okay, when this was happening, which we'll look at here in a minute, on the day of Pentecost, there was no Roman Catholic church over in, in, in Italy at the same time. There was no American church. There was no European church. There was no Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. There was no Armenian church, Syrian church, Coptic church. There was no African church. There was no other church. They were not even the church yet. They were about to become the church. They weren't the church yet. But they were the seed of the church. So the original 120 that we're told about here in the book of Acts represents the whole church. That was birthed on the day of Pentecost. They all were commanded and they all received this baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. So what 
precedent does that set? Very simple. Okay, for you intellectual people out there, I'm not talking uh, some retarded or spaced out spiritual, you know, hokey pokey stuff here. I'm speaking very down to earth, straight on, right? Logic, am I not? Any logical person would see this as the next, uh, you know, progression or conclusion. What you would deduce from this is if this represented the whole church then, unless we see something in the scripture that says it will no longer represent the whole church later, which absolutely does not exist. Okay? Absolutely not. Nowhere in the New Testament do we have something that cancels this out. Then we can only deduce from the information given to us here that this remains the standard or the precedent for the church throughout eternity. Every member of the body of Christ, every believer... To be baptized in the Holy Spirit is to receive this power from on high. Okay? So, therefore, in the book of the Acts of the Apostles found in the New Testament, which we've looked at in the second chapter of that book, we looked at the first chapter, now we're going to look at the second chapter, we find that they were all gathered together in that upper room in obedience to the Lord, as he had said, where they had shared their last supper with him. They were assembled together for several days. Okay? For you impatient Americans out there, you impatient Americans, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, uh, Western Europeans especially, you you postmodern people so impatient, you microwave people, you instant credit people, They had to wait a couple of days. God tested their patience, tested their obedience to see if they were going to obey. So they waited several days in obedience to the command their Lord had given them at his ascension to tarry or wait for the promise of the Father, the baptism of fire that Christ would send from heaven. And we are told that the Holy Spirit The third person of the Trinity descended and landed upon, listen, because we're going to see it in the scripture, landed upon each one of them, just like I stated, every one of the 120. He descended and landed upon each one of them in the form of cloven tongues of fire. Upon this occurring, they were all filled. They were all filled filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Let's look at the scripture that that talks about this. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, I'm reading from the Amplified. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled together in one place. When suddenly there came a sound from heaven, like the rushing of a violent tempest blast, And it filled the whole house in which they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues resembling fire. There appeared to them tongues resembling fire, which were separated and distributed, and listen, and that settled on each one of them. And they were all filled, diffused throughout their souls, with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other different foreign languages or tongues, as the Spirit kept kept giving them clear and loud expression in each tongue in appropriate words. Do you see that? He came upon each one of them. They were all filled, and they all spoke in tongues. The Spirit gave them utterance. I actually like the uh, King James better here than than the Amplified. It said that the Spirit came upon them all, and they all spake in other tongues 
as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit gave them, as Jesus said, the power, the ability, the efficiency. He gave them the ability to do it, but they spake. See the cooperation? This is what a lot of people don't understand either. They expect this thing to just happen to them. As if a demon spirit possessed them. Some of you have had experience with demon spirits in the past. Some of you have experienced automatic writing. Some of you may have even been mediums where a demon spirit spoke through you. Or you had a demon spirit cast out of you and you heard the spirit speaking. You felt a demon driving you to do something beyond you doing it yourself. These blackouts. And a lot of these autistic things that we're seeing in people today, they sound just like the the events that occurred in, for instance, the Gospel of Mark, when the child, when the when the man came to Christ and said, "The Spirit throws him into the fire. The Spirit throws him into the water. The Spirit seizes his tongue. The Spirit causes him to choke himself to death. Whatever the, the demon spirits take over and possess forcefully like that." And because people understand that about demon spirits, they think the Holy Spirit's that way. But the Holy Spirit is not that way. The Holy Spirit comes, yes, with great power as we see here. But the Holy Spirit wants a cooperation. He wants a yielding. He wants a surrender. He's not coming in and seizing power and forcing you against your will. That's not the way God created us. God doesn't want robots. He doesn't want automatons. He doesn't want slaves in that sense. He wants willing and obedient servants, sons and daughters of the Most High. So the Holy Spirit gives us the power to speak in other tongues. He gives us, he gives us even the tongue, utterance, but we speak with the other tongues. You see the cooperation there? It's just a, it's just an extension or or a graduation of what I'm talking to you all about all the time about when it comes to intimacy. Intimacy is what? Not just a monologue from God to us or a monologue from us to God, but it's a dialogue, an interaction, an intercourse if you will. A oneness being exhibited, demonstrated, experienced between God and ourselves. It's the same with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So, so those of you that are praying to receive this, like I've told you, get alone. Get in your quote-unquote prayer closet and open yourself up to the Lord and pray. And ask, there. then you can talk to Jesus. Ask Jesus. To baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Ask him to send the Holy Spirit upon you and into you. That you can pray to Jesus about. And he will answer. But you have to understand that it's a cooperation. So many of you have had this experience where you just kind of sat there, you know, waiting without being willing to move your tongue, move your mouth expecting like it would happen with a demon spirit, where a demon spirit would seize you and force your tongue to speak something you don't want to. No, that's not the way this works, folks. It's a yielding. It's a cooperation. And this is a for, for, uh, foreshadowing or a prophetic example of how the rest of your Christian walk and the rest of your fellowship and communion with the Godhead will be throughout eternity. That cooperation, that communion, that oneness, that fellowship, that dialogue, that intercourse. It's not a one-way street. Not a one-way street coming down from God forcing you, and not a one-way street coming up from you forcing God. Yet so many Christians are living this way today, expecting God to force them, or on the other side of the coin, trying to force God to do what they want. Either way, either extreme is an error. It's a cooperation, people. It's a flowing. It's a give and take. Do you understand? 
So those of you that will feel burdened after listening to this teaching to go and seek this from Jesus, understand this. This is a surrender, but a surrender is not, uh, you know, like standing before a firing squad and just, you know, expecting to be shot and there's nothing you can do. You just stand there and take the bullets. No, that's not that's not what this is. See this more, and please don't take this in the wrong way and get perverted with it, but it really is a picture. That's why God uses the marriage bed always as, as a picture, as a metaphor, as an example of spiritual intercourse between the Godhead and the believer. Think of it more as lovemaking in the spiritual sense, right? Of knowing. I, t I gave you the definition of eternal life. I think it was last week. I mentioned it again. That Jesus gave the definition of eternal life. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life. To know God the Father and to know Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That word know is the same word that's used when it talks about. And uh, Jacob knew Rachel and they begat. Joseph. It's that intimacy, that oneness. The Song of Solomon. That's why I use the Song of Solomon in the book God is Not Religious to describe that intimacy because it's a, it's a metaphorical picture of the spiritual lovemaking. That's why you always re hear me refer to the Holy Spirit as my lover and my Lord. The Holy Spirit is my lover and my Lord. Can you say that tonight? Can you say that tonight? If not, don't condemn yourself. But say, Lord Jesus, I want that. Let me have that experience, Lord. Give me that. Okay? So I, I felt the need to bring that out because many people, I think, struggle with that and don't understand about receiving the baptism. And you got people, you know, laying hands on them, you know, pushing their head off of their neck you know, and, and telling, you know, speaking in tongues and telling them to, to speak just like they do. And it's so forced and mechanical and impersonal. And people, sh you know, they close up and they shut down many times. Because that's not the spirit in which we are to receive this. Look at it as a lovemaking. It's, it's easier for women to understand, I believe, because normally the woman is, is the one who receives She's the one who surrenders. She's the one who submits in the lovemaking. She allows herself to be taken. She allows herself to be ravished. She allows herself to be loved upon. Yeah? The man has a harder time because he's the aggressor, see? And so he has a harder time seeing himself as the bride of Christ. Okay, men? Uh, you know, don't get gay that other way, but maybe get a little, find your feminine side here. Find, find that feminine side of you here and allow the Holy Spirit to be the bridegroom and you take the position of the bride and allow the Holy Spirit to enrapture you. Allow him to lift you into ecstasy. Allow him to love on you, to love in you, to love through you, to envelop you, to possess you, to ravish you. I know that sounds strange to your ears, but I'm telling you people, that's what it's all about. And if you'll come before the Lord that way, you will receive that love and compassion that 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 romance that's why i call my book god is not religious a divine romance see god didn't didn't create us to be religious but he did create us to be involved in a divine romance okay now, concerning to tongues in relation to this event that we just uh, quoted here from the scripture, the Godhead wanted to emphasize the central rule 
that speaking in tongues held for their experience so emphatically that the Holy Spirit actually manifested himself in the form of tongues of fire falling on each one of them. Right? The Holy Spirit actually appeared to them. So all you people that are stumbling so much over tongues, that are so anti-tongue, well, I want the baptism, but I don't have to speak in tongues. It's not about tongues. Well, apparently God thought it was about tongues. Apparently God is pro-tongues. To the point that God, the Holy Spirit, not only give the ability to speak in tongues, but actually appeared himself as a flaming tongue. So apparently, God is pro-tongue. So for you people out there who say you love God and you serve God, but you want nothing to do with tongues, well, you're not in agreement with God, because God is pro-tongues. Paul say, I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. So there are even tongues in heaven. Yes, I hate to break it to you. Okay, all you Baptists and other people that are so, uh, you know, anti-tongues, anti Pentecostal, anti-charismatic, you're going to be very upset up in the kingdom. Because even the angels speak in tongues. Paul said, I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. So angels also have a tongue. Or tongues that they speak in. So we also know as a fact, as related in the scripture, that every one of these believers, I've said that already, were filled with this baptism of fire by the Holy Ghost. All of them spoken tongues. This was the seed of the church. The entire church represented in seedling form. Therefore, the precedent was, yes, set for every believer to be filled in this, in this way and to exhibit this manifestation for having received the kingdom of God into their very being. So I want to deal with you people in closing here because there's such a big talk out there by all you arrogant, uh, don't want the Holy Spirit people who want to stay in your flesh and continue to rely on your mind. This is the manifestation of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So stop telling me, well, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I don't speak in tongues. Well, no, you're, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're not baptized in the Holy Spirit if you don't speak in tongues. Yeah, but tongues is just a gift. It's not a... No, you're wrong again. Because this was the whole church. There's nothing in Acts that mentions about gifts of the Spirit. It doesn't say, and on John came the gift of mercy, and on Peter came the gift of prophecy, and on James came the gift of tongues, and on Sister Sally came the gift of healing. It doesn't say that. This had nothing to do with gifts. That's a later manifestation. A further manifestation of the Holy Spirit's ministry. This is the initial reception, manifestation, and exhibition of the kingdom of God or the person of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit entering into a believer. Is this manifestation of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives us the utterance? Therefore, we espy no prejudice, no distinction or division concerning the granting and reception of this life-giving, intimacy-creating, and spiritual empowering endowment of the Holy Spirit's very person, possessing his purchased, redeemed vessel. It is his right. You say you're submitted to Christ? You say you are a servant of Christ? Some of you are even so religious, you like to quote Paul's letters, I am a bond slave of Christ. Are you really, Mr. Baptist? Are you really, Mr. Lutheran? Are you really, Mr. Presbyterian? Are you really, Mr. Seeker-friendly? Well, you haven't become a slave to speaking in tongues, and that's the first command that Jesus gave you. So don't tell me how much of a bond slave and a servant and everything else you are. And by the way, minister is just an old-fashioned that means servant. Okay? So if you're a minister of the Lord, and you have not had this experience, you're in error. 
taking this to its farthest and deepest implication, this was literally the person of the Holy Spirit in one of his desired forms. Listen to me. This was the person of God, the Holy Spirit, in one of his desired forms. Tongues of fire. So with this understanding established, rejecting this experience is not just as many non-believers in glossolalia or speaking in tongues contend, merely rejecting over the being passed over for a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is in fact the rejection of the very person of the Holy Spirit himself. For these initial believers did not receive an isolated particular gift of the Spirit, but contrarily were filled to capacity with the very essence of the Holy Ghost being. And with these scriptures, Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Receive the Holy Spirit, saints. I love you all. We'll speak again next Sunday. God bless you.